right, so thank you all for coming. Um, I wanted to start my um, process or my presentation by showing you first um, these images up here, and these are images of refugees in a uh, Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. Um, and you can read these as I present or you know, afterwards just to kind of put a face to uh, the problem that I looked at. And the title of my thesis is Indi uh, The Refugee Experience, Individual Survival to Community Engagement. Um, and that has, you know, it's a working title, it's changed throughout. Um, but this is, I wanted to show you this photo because this photo uh, relates to the problem that I was looking at, which was forced displacement um, at the beginning of this process and the fact that, um, you know, people become refugees when uh, they have a fear of being persecuted by their own government based on, you know, certain characteristics and they make the decision to uh, either move away from their home into another country um, or they end up in a refugee camp uh, in another country. Um, and this is just an image of the precedent that I looked at. Um, and this, this is the normal architectural response to you know, forced displacement and how to house these people that really have to kind of start a new life. Um, and the main thing from this is that it's supposed to be a temporary settlement, um, but many times it ends up being there for decades and they're not necessarily planned uh, to, to be you know, used for such a long period of time. And another idea is that they're there to meet basic needs, you know, water, food, um, and, you know, uh, hygiene. Um, and as for uh, organizations that are in charge of this, um, I don't know if there's a player, but the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees has certain regulations in place already. Um, and, you know, it's, it's based on a module of 20,000 people. Um, and in this diagram, you can kind of see that the camp would be divided up into four districts, which are divided up into four blocks. And then those blocks are divided up, up into 16 clusters, but those clusters are many times usually just gridded um, shelters. And then those clusters are made up of uh, 16 families that house four to six people, um, but they receive you know, one, one shelter or 10. Um, and with that, it, there's certain amenities that go along with, um, you know, those different uh, parts of the camp. And you can see at the camp level, it's sort of the organizational uh, uh, program, like a registration, NGO office, health center. Um, at the district level, it starts to, uh, you know, get a little bit more uh, down to the level of the people. So possible schools, recreation spaces, distribution centers, where you go and pick up food, um, you know, not necessarily a grocery store, but distribution centers. And as you go down, it, you know, there's, um, you're trying to meet the basic needs. Um, so as I studied the refugee camps, this idea of indefinite temporality kept coming up, and the fact that um, these camps, you know, are meant to be for a longer period, or meant to be for a short period of time. Um, but they end up uh, being there for a while because of the nature of conflicts that cause them. So I looked at uh, I looked at this problem through the Syrian civil war, um, and if you've been watching, you know, the news at all, um, it started in 2011 and it escalated a lot in mid, uh, 2012, and the number of people increased dramatically. Um, and you can, and I'm looking at displacement into Jordan. Um, so you can see the region, and this map shows, it's also up here, um, it shows areas of um, you know, different ownership that people have, whether it's uh, guerrilla groups or the army or the government. Um, and the yellow shows contested regions, so spaces that people are fighting over. Um, and this series is talking about um, where people are moving from. So, you know, you can see that they're moving from this area up here into uh, the northern region of Jordan. 
and then that relates to sort of the contested areas within Jordan. Uh, it makes sense that people are you know, moving from the highest areas of conflict into Jordan. Um, and the number of Syrian refugees, uh, this is from February 2015, it's 3.8 million people, so it's a very large number of people. Um, you know, and at the beginning I started, it's a very large number and the process of how do you, you know, deal with such a large number. Um, and I looked at that through the regional scale first um, and looking at how they had already, uh, you know, set up certain uh, refugee camps along the, closer to the border. Um, and for this thesis, I looked at uh, the Tari camp. Um, and you can see it over here at the regional level. Um, this was a camp that was started, uh, it was built very fast. Um, and at the regional level, you can see that Amman, the capital of Jordan, is down here. And it's kind of isolated, um, you know, closer, still close to the uh, Syrian border, which is the conflict region. So how far away from Amman? Um, it's about uh, 36 miles. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like it's open desert. It's yeah, yeah. So um, I kind of use that to go through a process of uh, looking at site parameters for a possible new camp. Um, and basically, two main things came up: accessibility and resources to other. Um, you know, whether it's universities or infrastructure, um, water resource within the uh, within the region. Um, and again, it was I went through this process to kind of come up with these parameters, but it, it's not necessarily where the thesis uh, progressed um, because I once I started, you know, studying the camp itself, it kind of. Uh, is more at the urban scale. Um, so this is an aerial of Zatri, um, and you can see the density you know, within the camp itself. Um, this is a growth, and you can see it, it grew up to its extent that the land that was given to um, you know, set up the camp, it, it, it grew pretty fast. Um, and because of that, uh, you can see the highlighted parts are different uh, amenities uh, within the camp, and they're kind of dispersed throughout. They end up, you know, being at the edges of the camp. Um, some are in the middle, uh, and that seems to be, you know, it's not equally dispersed between all the people that end up in the camp. Um, and I tried to relate it back to, you know, categories that exist within uh, normal, you know, what we see as cities. So, you know, the author authoritative and political aspects of the city, economic, religious, social, and educational. Um, and the fact that in refugee camps, the community spaces are, are more important uh, because, again, the nature of the problem. Uh, people are, you know, moved from, moved and are left with nothing but themselves and, a, you know, some objects that they wanted to bring. So, how are, community spaces uh, basically thought of in this uh, in this camp. Um, and then I'm just gonna go through a couple of series that describe sort of the uh, fabric of the camp. So you can see um, this is a newer part, it's more, uh, it's more dense. And as it grew, uh, the camp was, you know, they started to kind of organize it a little bit. Um, you can see that the uh, there's a mix of communal kitchens and people who you know try to bring those resources within their household within the camp. Um, electricity was is a big problem because you know they set up uh, electricity for the camp itself, but not necessarily for the shelter itself. So people began to you know just wiring up to the um, uh, to the light to the electric poles to get light into their personal household. Um, and then looking at the shelter, when you first come to a camp, you receive a um, temporary shelter and then wait for a caravan or a better uh, shelter as time goes by. Um, and one thing that, you know, kind of uh, help, or one thing that um, related, relates to this, the, 
emphasis moving forward was the fact that resources um, are not necessarily organized uh, around people. Um, and this image shows two water towers that are kind of walled off um, around a cluster of um, shelters. And again, the caravans are literally brought into the camp on with a crane, and that um, you know there isn't necessarily a way to build build those within the camp because um, because of the way that they're set up right now. Um, and that leads me to the idea of the cluster. And this this is the cluster that the guidelines speak of. Usually, it's gridded, and we have other resources like um, these are communal kitchens and I studied the way that uh, you know one of those changed over time and it's also up here um, and you can see that people you know started to move the shelters around according to their own needs and um, yeah so at the end you can kind of start to see a pattern you know within within um, the cluster and people have started adding tents and pieces of caravans to their own household. Um, and then even looking at uh, formations within each of the districts, you know, the idea of this cluster and people um, trying to get closer, uh, in closer vicinity to other households or communities to create this, you know, smaller public space that's for them. So these typologies have occurred organically? Yeah, yeah. And, and these were the ones actually that you observed. Yeah, so all of these are, you know, from uh, different districts. Um, and this, you know, this is from the older part of the camp, so you can see kind of the transformation over time. Which so, leads... So, could you go through how it transformed? Um, I, I don't have that for each one, but basically the idea is that people add uh, you know, caravans and tents to the, the first one that they get um, and then they start to shift them around and this was a pattern that I found a lot in the camp. Because there's, there's a cluster pattern and then there's a pattern. Yeah, so... Yeah. So, so both occurring? Yeah, so both are occurring and this kind of relates back to the idea of is this a city, you know, I put this here because it talks about, you know, the alley and then also a road that could exist within I think it's important to mention here that these clusters also form in response to social conditions. Yeah, right? um, so, so he just said that these clusters form based on social, um, you know, relationships. So people come in an extended family, so they want to be closer to their own, uh, <coughs> and, and they, you know, kind of group up so that they're closer. There's a whole bunch of interested people behind you. And so, <laughs> we have to work really hard to make this not become a private conversation between you and the presenter. And make sure that you project your yell at her, <laughs> not at her. I'm placing this out of consideration for the folks back here who can't hear what's going on. So that leads me to sort of the process um, and design of the camp itself. Um, and based on the idea that people are, you know, uh, combining their households, I am proposing that when people do come to a refugee camp, they receive a shelter and, you know, a space or a plot of land that they can, they have space to grow their shelter. Um, and basically when you come to the camp, you go through the normal, uh, you know, process. You have to be registered. You get your health check, um, but then your orientation to the camp should include kind of the explanation of the way that the shelters are growing and built, so that there isn't this sort of uh, chaotic uh, um, or organic, uh, you know, change over time that makes it harder for the camp organizers to give resources to people or get them to people uh, fast. Um, so this is uh, sort of a, this is describing the change. So when people first come, they still get a, you know, a temporary shelter, but the structure within the um, temporary shelter is built in a way so that you also receive a kit of parts so you can start to build out the, um, the more permanent shelter. And this is sort of the 
the final design to that, and it's based on a module that's three feet by three feet. So the idea that a lot of, there's a lot of kids in the camp, that's usually the higher um, percentage of the population. So you know, everyone should be able to be part of this uh, process. Um, and then for the tent itself, it has you know solar uh, panels so that each household gets the electricity right away and it's to their own household so there isn't necessarily a need to you know uh, take from the camp grid itself um, and then also the idea that you would be able to grow uh, your own uh, food on in the uh, roof plane and this is something that's actually happening now um, with a school that they're building so they're trying out new ways that you can bring you know resources and give people resources in their own hands um, and then finally, it's raised up off the ground plane so that it's, uh, that's a big problem, you know, and um, just so people are kind of protected from the ground plane itself. Um, and at the same time, the structure allows it to be modified and so that you can kind of grow out of the first tent itself. Um, and then these tents are, again, placed in a cluster formation and those plots of lands are kind of organized around uh, water towers, a communal kitchen, and wash centers, which include latrines and uh, uh, showers. So again, giving people the resources within their cluster from the beginning um, so that they are able to uh, you know, kind of grow in a more organized manner. Um, and then this series is uh, it's also down here. Um, it shows the kind of how the tent form, uh, formation uh, creates the cluster itself. So it's changing, you know, as people move in um, over time. And the, you know, this is my projection, obviously, but um, once people, once it gets more dense, it creates a more uh, habitable public space within the uh, within the cluster itself. So that people have a smaller, you know, community space within the cluster. Um, so I use that idea of the cluster to. Um, it's right here. It'll get bigger, but I use that cluster to um, <laughs> to kind of design the module for the camp. Uh, so 16 clusters is one block, and uh, four blocks is a district. Um, and then four districts is the camp module, and then I'll go through each one just to describe the amenities that, are, that exist within. So within the block, uh, you have a smaller community space um, that has you know spaces like women's center, youth center, um, health clinic, but also a state religious space and uh, what I'm calling a creation space, which would be um, you know, places where people can go and use the internet, um, make their bot labs, because this is, you know, it's an ever-changing place, so they should be able to get the resources that most people um, have. Um, and then also the fact that when you start to multiply the clusters, it, it creates um, backyards and front yards, and because, again, people come in extended families, they might be able to, you know, kind of be assigned plots that are closer to each other so that they don't have to later on um, move their tents. And this image, which is the one down here, just shows you know, a possible progression of how the uh, tents are changing over time and people start to kind of add to the structure that's um, And again, looking at the community space, which is the perspective all the way down there, um, just talking about a smaller community space for uh, people within the block. You know, the mosque, um, because this is set in Jordan, um, uh, community spaces and you know, recreation spaces. And it all connects back to, you know, this is connects back to the rest of the camp. So the four, block, four blocks are part of the district, and within the district, the, uh, the modules create a space that um, you know, holds the schools and larger recreational spaces, um, as well as uh, uh, grocery stores and a space for a possible market. Um, and again, that's important because you want to have uh, economic, uh, you know, growth within the camp. And this is actually something um, 
that's happening already. If you look at this image, this is called the Champs Elysees in the Zatry camp because there's a big uh, French, uh, you know, NGO that works there, and this was totally impromptu. You know, people started setting up their shops and um, selling goods and trying to make money and uh, you know survive within the camp. Um, Um, and then going to the uh, camp module, um, you start to see, you know, how this could possibly relate to a, uh, a city in the making. You get street hierarchy, and these are district compounds, which could possibly in the future be spaces for, uh, you know, public plazas that exist within the camp. Um, and again, the organization uh, lends to you know, smaller community spaces as well as bigger places for people to meet um, and start to think about, you know, possible roads and uh, what you could put in this camp to make it uh, not necessarily more permanent, but more, um, I guess, uh, closer in form of what people might already, you know, know as a city. I had a question. Yeah. What happens in the Duke New World? So what happens to that particular thing? So in my study um, for the tent itself, I actually looked at you know the smaller module mm -hmm. so that if you receive this kit of parts, you would technically be able to take it with you. Um, so you can take apart the tent and you know take it back to whatever uh, you know if it's usually it's a war. So if you somehow are able to take all those pieces and kind of rebuild it there because most probably in this case your household is probably destroyed. Mm -hmm. So you need a way, and that's, you know, the uh, figuring that out is still in the process, but the idea that there should be a kit of parts that is able, that you're able to put together and take apart. But in your current study, when people leave, they just leave the space? Yeah. And somebody else moves? Yeah. Yeah. Or some, or people will, you know, try to take that empty caravan as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things you said was something about uh, tempor temporary mm -hmm. and uh, permanence. The tension between those. Mm -hmm. I think I either you said it and I missed it, or you didn't say it. Uh, the length of the average length of time that a family is in one of these camps is eleven years. Mm -hmm. Eleven years. 11 years. And I mean, uh, it depends on the conflict, but you know, if you think about uh, Palestinian refugee camps, those are technically cities now, you know, so it's a pretty long process, and this is sort of looking at, um, I guess I'll end on, the, on this aerial over there that starts to look at, you know, the smaller community spaces uh, that start to, uh, or using the smaller module to, create these uh, other public spaces that host, you know, community spaces because this is um, not a dire situation, but when you come in, you know, that's something that you probably need more than, you know, being a, a, the individual self. Um, and just in this area, you can start to see how this might connect to the other community space um, in the camp and also the Market Street and the grocery store. Um, and before I open up for discussion, I just want to uh, thank my committee, uh, Liz Kiros, Michelle Lampecos, and Steve Hurt, um, and also all of my friends who helped me throughout this week. Uh, thank you so much, um, and also my parents. Especially, especially your parents. Especially your parents. Yeah, would you respond on a slide this yeah. way, uh, so you can get more cycloramic vista? The, the refugees, because um, I see a lot of individualization of the, the camp, of individual tents and so on. What kind of access do they have to these resources? Because uh, some are selling goods and some are selling produce and so on. Yes. So there's definitely a black market within the camp <laughs> itself. Um, but. You know, these things are brought in from other people, but if there is, you know, a market street, possible market street set up, then that could be, uh, 
organized in a way so that doesn't happen. Um, but also, you know, thinking about uh, the host country and how it's uh, it's kind of a burden on them as well. And what people are the newest camps like within the past couple months have started doing is that they set the host country itself starts setting up, you know, grocery stores within the camp. So they're already starting to think of it as, you know, this might be here for a long time, so we might as well invest. It's a fascinating call. Because, <clears throat> I mean, since you're designing the city, yeah. um, and so many of our cities in the Western culture are built on Roman camps. Because the, the, the layout's very militaristic in the sense of efficiency not for social relation. And so to, so to me, that it's interesting how the social question takes place and, and how people can actually move these things that look fairly permanent yeah. and, and set them up and how all of that occurs. So you're designing this kit of parts that can be moved as well as taken with you. Mm -hmm. um, are these weight becomes an issue? Do you pick it all, the whole thing up, and move it somewhere, or do you well, build it, would, it in place, or how does that? Yeah, so you would you would be able to build it in place. Um, think of it as sort of an IKEA kit mm -hmm. where you can put the pieces together because it is in a smaller uh, module. Um, and what you were speaking to earlier about the fact that um, you know the kind of uh, I guess struggle between what people want and again like a, kind of a militaristic uh, uh, gridded new city I think it's diff it might be different with a camp because you're trying to uh, provide all these services so you have to have some type of organization that makes it more efficient um, for people to get to you know the resources that they need because they don't have anything and it's kind of starting from scratch, but you're right, it's kind of been a uh, something to keep reminding yourself about. I'm just curious if, is whether or not, because we, we're getting refugee camps all over the place, is whether, whether or not there's beginning of uh, certain typologies of work, yeah. you know, to build the commercial area first and then depopulate it, or does that grow organically? After you get the population there, it stays on the ground. I'm just curious because you're, these are being created all the time. Mm -hmm. um, with essentially very little plan in a sense of, of the whole social structure. So that's being created. In this case, the Syrians are coming to this camp. Is there anything that, in terms of culturally, that's being brought? Is is the Syrian culture different than the Jordanian culture, for example, um, versus the United Nations? Is there anything that's being transported? Well, I think that within Syria and Jordan, there isn't that much of a difference. But I think, you know, the idea of the cluster works here. But that's because of, you know, doing the study and seeing people moving their um, houses around. And even, you know, I looked at uh, sort of the historic growth of cities in the region, and there seems to be that uh, the interior courtyard comes up a lot, so, you know, relating that back to possible growth of just the cluster and how that could become, you know, part of that typology, but I think um, it would definitely need to be looked at within each region. Yeah, I'm very curious that your, your, your plan, your ideal plan, starts almost as if it's Savannah, Georgia, yeah. and, and builds from there. Um, Things like water are very important to have that work yeah. next to the source of water. So, um, I also just had a lot of questions about this climate in the sense of how you provide shade other than in your own tent or the floor. Yeah, so, so that relates to you know the idea that you can kind of build out on the shelter, so in your kind of parts and within the, you know, if there's uh, uh, Market Street and you know grocery stores and de not department stores, but places that provide those materials within the camp so that you are able to build out. Um, 
and again, it, time has been sort of mm -hmm. like the timeline has been a theme throughout. And you know, when is it that you like how I can't really say the timeline because you know it's it's a real life conflict. And um, but in I guess in the ideal situation, people would be able to kind of build out their tent, and then if the economy within the camp grows, be able to you know make modifications within. So the, uh, could you highlight the square foot on your plot that you're suggesting? In your yeah, so it's so, oh, on the plot. So this is 24 feet by uh, 24 feet. Okay. Um, Did you arrive at it? Sorry. Yeah, so I... The logic yeah, so it was based on, um, you know, looking at the way that people were moving mm -hmm. um, here, as well as people being able to at least grow their uh, tent out. Uh, to twice the size and then possibly build up. So, so the tent is 10 by 10? The tent is um, 9 by 18. Right. And that model came back from? That was based on sort of looking at the ones that exist already okay. um, and kind of grew from that model. And the same thing you're proposing for all your communal spaces, the market space, are all on that model. Yeah, and I haven't, you know, gotten that much into that detail, but at least for the market uh, space, using that same module to to grow. Could you just say something about the sun? Like, I think you did not say the sun. Just say um, a few words about the materiality. Is that the way it's declining, right? So yeah. What are these panels? A question about, about materiality. <laughs> <laughs> So the panels themselves um, would be, you know, based on the climate, this is sort of just the module of um, kind of putting on the facade, but perforated panels as well as uh, sort of a breathable fabric um, that allows for, you know, air and ventilation into the tent itself because a lot of um, the existing ones are sort of aluminum panels and it becomes very hot, so you're trying to have um, some type of material that uh, you know, is breathable and let it. But doesn't it get very cold in the night? Yeah, it does. And that's, you know, something so in the yeah, process. It's a desert. Yeah. So I guess maybe they'll have both. Yeah. And again, it's based on the module. So if the module can fit, you know, the perforated panel, it could also kind of fit in that other is. materials that are the same. No, oh, it's a beautiful study. I had a couple, one question. You, the, your piece here is based on the ideal UN standard, 20,000. I'm sorry, or, did you? you? Your piece there is based on the first thing you talked about, that is this, the UN recommendation on 20,000 people organized in four districts, yeah, each so subdivided into four blocks. Uh, so does that represent 20,000 people? So mine is actually smaller because mm -hmm. I'm creating, you know, the smaller community spaces. So the UN uh, cluster is 16 families and mine is 12. So that creates, you know, a, I would say a reasonable uh, public space that can house those water towers. So mine is about, I think, 15,000. And it's still a pretty large number, um, but it's still trying to, you know, think about. So you adjusted that. You said this is 80,000. Yes. Yeah. So at this point. So were you looking at this as one piece of a larger, I mean, as a way that this might, or one of those might fit into a quadrant of that, or yes. is this an independent study on a separate site? I used this to kind of see how it was changing over time, uh -huh. um, but this is kind so of... So this is kind of a site-free study yeah. of an idealized yeah. organization. Um, I mean, I think the most interesting thing is in terms of kind of fundamental principle that this idea of adaptation versus a world of service and efficiency versus what certainly I see as traditional patterns and, and certainly true in Jordan and I'm quite sure in Syria. I mean, I would have been very interested to see, for instance, if you took 80,000 people or 20 or 15,000 people and showed us what a scale comparable would be that looks at both the amount of space it occupies in a traditional settlement, low scale, and you know, most of 
those settlements, even the parts of Jordan, you know, not more than two stories, not three stories. I mean, the parts of it certainly taller. But but what would an equivalent size community look like, and how much space would it consume in in, in a traditional? And I, I know in a traditional, it is going to be, you know, of the meander rather than of the kind of Roman <coughs> castrum. Um, even though some of those cities were based on that originally, but certainly when they adapted, they adapted into tight units and, and also contiguous buildings. Very, very few circumstances that I can think of in any of these communities where you're looking at an individual unit surrounded by space that they cluster for comfort and it's both warmth yeah. and protection from the sun. So, I mean, my first question is why, why, why are those individual units surrounded by space. And the second is just to, that is there a way you could imagine, because I do think that the kind of adaptability over time and adjustments to accommodate different family groups or individual circumstances, if, you know, if you're looking at 11 years uh, of, uh, of um, habitation here, I mean, it, it appealed to me a great deal. And, and I just wonder if you couldn't get efficiency in service, but also have a degree of adaptability that, that I don't see, and a degree of density that I don't see in, in, uh, in, in the, the pattern here. Yeah, I mean, the pattern is, or the space that you're talking about is for, you know, it's the plot of land so people would be able to build out, and that's sort of a beginning. You know, I would imagine that this does get denser as you start to see the later on clusters mm. that start to fill in. So that could create, uh, you know, the density that a normal city might have. Um, and then what was so the, then those densities would change too. I mean, you're talking yeah. 15,000 people, but presumably as those build out, they, they, they increase population as well. Yeah, I guess and, they yeah, and to, if the family itself needs to, you know, yeah, increase yeah. the number. So, well, so it's interesting because you're struggling with, I think, and I'm saying this for, for everybody, you're struggling, we're all struggling with the, essentially the, the conflict or the difficulty of having the people themselves in, engage in the process of settlement, resettlement, and, and build out, and the necessity of the sort of larger organization to service the community. And um, in, the, in the early, phases in this project, much like what you had said about a more organic. In, in our minds, a lot of these communities, the older communities do have that kind of more organic kind of quality to it, but indeed, when she looked at the, um, where these people were mostly coming from, they're coming from the more standard uh, 19th century cities that are gridded kinds of organizations. The, so, so the the form, particularly where you don't have the, the next thing was what kind of site, right? And the recommendations are a flat, flat well-drained site, yes. right? Indoor. Not not a condition where you have a topographic situation that would more naturally, organically provide for those kind of irregular patterns, and 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 so there's that you know essential conflict that that. That tends to lead. So those two things, these were all really tough decisions. Those two things lead to the more militaristic. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's easy to miss here is one critical difference that she has done is to say that you don't just give them the caravan, you don't just give them the building, you give them the plot of land. It's the plot of land that then enables the right to the land, that enables the density that that you're trying to find. It gets built out. I, I guess that's because I, yes. the issue for me is, in a sense, taking what is a dense grid, but producing a suburban block. And so the question is the block size, the plot size, etc. Is how do you create a grid which is adaptable and and the relationship of fronts, backs, all of those issues that we see in cities, and how you can create 
at the same time, a grid could yet still allow for variation to occur on a natural basis. Unfortunately, you're working with a flat desert site, so you don't have any topography. In the sense, the context is alien in that sense. And so the only context you have to create here are these individual houses, in a sense. But how they relate to one another and form streets and fronts and backs and all of that in a hot climate goes back to what the living conditions were like where they came from. How can that context be brought into the new context and, and, and somehow brought together such that you still don't lose the tradition at the same time they're in a new environment that's going to give them the ability to prosper individually at the same time. One clarification I'd like to make to what Steve said was that um, we didn't talk so much about the social economic conditions in the camp, but most people are from villages. Mm -hmm. And I think the main cultural divide here um, is the rural urban divide, yeah. right? So the, the more prosperous refugees go to cities, they live with families, they're taken care of. So the representative population of these camps is unusually poor yeah. and overwhelmingly rural. And and not as educated as well. And more yeah, less educated, and that's why sort of there's the bigger public space for the schools because ch there's a high population of children within the camp. So you know, providing or giving importance to amenities such as schools and recreational spaces. So, so this density, even in what you're proposing, is alien to where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Villages are built. Oh, the contiguous buildings. Okay, well. so they like are, those so analytic just, models that okay. showed. The, they look a lot like villages. Okay. Yeah, the way camps are all look like them. Well, <clears throat> thank you for uh, choosing this very important topic. Um, I have a question. Uh, two years ago, I visited northern Iraq uh, for some research, but no, I faced this. Uh, unique uh, natural phenomena that I've heard for so many times, they, they call it sandstorm, dust storm, but I've never seen that. So, like it was summertime, August, 110 degrees, 115 degrees, and the sand and the dust in the air was so thick. Uh, so what happens in that condition, in the larger cities, uh, they provide like more public indoor spaces, and for a period of 10 to 15 days that the sandstorm is happening, people show up more in you know, indoor public spaces. And the cities, the way they respond to that is to increase uh, their windows. I was wondering, you know, what are your thoughts as, as you start to craft like, clusters of these communities to think about like finding sites uh, and uh, how this could respond to creating public space in the within these camps and how they could uh, respond to this natural phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, I guess it would have to go back to the module. Um, and I just, you know, I was at beginning to think about public space and, you know, where the district compound uh, over here ends up. And as you repeat that, there is, you know, it starts to create some uh, space that could possibly turn into public plazas and public space. Um, but that's not something that I've you know, looked into in detail. Um, and as far as the, uh, the tent itself, you know, when you first, I, I've seen like images of the sandstorm. So when you first, when you would first receive the sort of temporary shelter, it, it is covered, um, it's uh, fabric. So that's because it's built on that same sort of modular structure, you would be able to kind of cover up the uh, shelter itself. But that, that's an interesting point to think about even indoor public spaces within the camp. I like the idea of that you explore with the individual piece in a sense of using it for all kinds of different purposes and self-contained um, electricity as well as growing food and so on and life control and, water and all of that, which I think is really well done. Um, it's, it's still, how does one, in a sense, design a new city? It's really a basic question, uh, in a sense, um, of all of the 
because there's not much variety until, let's say, after a period of time, we you get the individualization of things that take place. Uh, but how do you create the, the core notion that then you can build from? And the question for me is what becomes the infill? And in what sequence does the infill happen? Do you build, do you build the public realm first and then the housing bodies? Or does the public realm happen organically because it's not there and people don't exist? But then you may end up with patterns that just are not particularly helpful in the sense that they may cause other problems in the process that don't work with the way that campus regions are going to So it's an interesting, really interesting question because these things, the United Nations kind of looks like, you know, you, you can rubber stamp things, but the problem is worldwide. But what we're really talking about is how do you bring the cultural heritage into these and to keep that identity in that it seems to me it's a, it's a major problem. I will warn you that without the uh, laying and the giving them the kit of parts, they may come up with an organic problem, giving them the freedom to create. So if the community yeah. encourages, I think you did achieve that, even though it looks very rigid. We don't know how it is yeah. because you don't have a human element in that, which you cannot predict. And I think that is, I think if you had just made a little more emphasis on your cluster formation, like that part, I think that would really highlight your thought process, which is a very good, very, I think the very essence of this thesis is that idea. And I think that is, a key for your, this strategy, I mean, this, this end. I think that's a very, and I applaud you for that. It's very, very hard to think of a temporary structure and think that there is a human element, even though it's for 11 years. 11 years in a person's life is a big deal, and for you to give that much importance, and I really like that shelter study you did that, and I wish you would spend a few more minutes explaining how you have saw all these transformations. There is like millions of possibilities with each one of these kids, and if each one of those kids were transformed differently, then it won't look like a military thing. So I really do applaud your pieces. I like the individual unit. I, I wonder though, both with it and the organization as a whole, uh, if you had taken another step beyond patterning and, and really dealt with design with climate, uh, if it wouldn't be quite different, that is, that if and, and could have been set up as kind of principles for site selection. You know, should it be a southern aspect of the slope? Should it be dead flat? Uh, should it be on a high point and so it catches the breezes? Should it be down lower where it's closer? Although I'm, I'm assuming all the water here is trucked in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but would the edges of this thing be different? Uh, because the, the the coral area of the sandstorm is. My memory in Amman is one of the wonderful things is every day the sun goes down, temperatures begin to decrease, and these breezes come up, extraordinary breezes that are, uh, you know, for me and my memory is there, the delight of the day is that time that lasts for two or three hours in the evening when the breezes come up and push all that heat out. And so, you know, I don't know what the patterns are, but I suspect you'd find patterns of summer breezes and sandstorms that vary uh, by climate, I mean by month and time, and whether all of that might have adjusted not only the way, you know, you treat your edges, but the individual spaces, whether they're south facing or north facing, and, and the individual units, whether they're, you know, the southern porch with, with shade possibilities or sun in the wintertime when you want that for it. But if, if you wouldn't come out with something very, very different within still maybe a well-organized thing, something that adapts to climate in a very, very explicit and I think appropriate way because it's certainly, you know, climate has a major impact on everything that happens here and energy. The, uh, chair, the, the uh, chair for this committee is Luis Queros. Michelle M. Prakos also served on the committee. Luis, would you like to Michelle, would you like to? Michelle wants to say something, and then I'll close. Yeah, just a couple quick comments. I mean, 
Uh, Stand up and turn around. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I work with you as a student on in, a, in our seminar on adaptation. So we've been through a lot of these issues for a long time. And I really think you you hit on one of the most difficult problems of, of any thesis that I've seen. So I really applaud you for taking that on. And um, I think, you know, so, as in many thesis presentations, a lot of the key issues come out. So architects love to make things and fix things mm -hmm. and make them look beautiful, but one of the tensions you identify is that nobody really wants these places to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. right? The people who move in, the host countries. So I think you've really captured that tension really well in your project. Like they, they look like they could, it could be dismantled and go away or it could evolve in, into something else. Um, I think you heard some great comments, many of which we touched on during the course of the semester. Two little pieces of advice I would make as you develop this project. Um, one is pay a little bit closer attention to the great analysis you did. What are people already doing? And how can that inform the evolution of these places? And the second is um, we heard about how these units uh, do or do not create front and back spaces. I would also say that. By, by lifting the unit off the ground, I think you lose an opportunity there because this is a place where life happens outdoors. So you're kind of severing that connection. Um, but otherwise, great job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, no, uh, very quick. Uh, first of all, what a pleasure working with you in these things. I think um, Lamna has brought to our attention a topic that is critical uh, because it's not only about displacement in some regions of the world, but it's also about. Uh, the relationship of informal settlements and formal settlements and what happens organically in our cities and uh, what happens at the core and what happens at the periphery. And I think you address that at many scales. And one of the things that I really appreciate about the way you looked at this was the multi-scalar approach that you had to it. Not, not just looking at the campus, the unit that can be replicated, um, but also you have some principles about how to develop them, uh, how to choose the site, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, I think that negotiation between the people and the government, because for 11 years these are going to be unwanted uh, uh, in, in, in individuals uh, that come to a country that many, many times is not prepared uh, to have 80,000 people, 100,000 people, is, is, uh, is a great comment by Michelle. Um, and lastly, um, I think this is a thesis that puts back people before and along uh, parallel to architecture. And a lot of the conversations that we have from the topics were really about the people that, that live here. So I want to congratulate you and thank you. Uh, great job. We're going to walk to the next spatial module and we're going to face that direction. Okay.